thank you, Professor Sanford, uh, for your patience. And we are back again into the Q&A session. And we have a lot of questions coming in. I'll start with some of them uh, for you. So I'll start with one question around. So I have noticed the yields for the CF transformations of the quinoline and pyridine were low using copper catalysis. That is 21% and 36% respectively. Is this due to the donating nature of the nitrogen on the aromatic ring or for any other reason? Um, all right, good question. I'm just gonna go to my, here, let's see, close that poll. Um, so I think the question is, I'll move all these things around on my screen, um, that uh, the pyridines are giving low yields here. So for example, pyridines and, and quinolins. Um, and uh, we don't entirely know why the yields are low. In some cases, we, you know, often we're doing these with boron reagents, we see some proto deborylation. So that's definitely a problem with some of those substrates. Um, in some cases, I think they are coordinating. I think that's a, that's a um, interesting um, suggestion. Um, you know, in some of our radio chemistry, we also use substrates like this and they actually do work pretty well. So some of it is just maybe it needs a little bit more optimization, but I think there's a combination of, of problems uh, in, the, in these kind of reactions. Some bind to the copper, some proto deborylation and some probably with, with really focused optimization, we could get these to work better. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Sanford. Uh, we'll take the next question. So does Crown Ether work in dissolving potassium fluoride in aprotic solvents. So this is a question by some of uh, some yep. attendee. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. And, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, in fact, there was a, a really nice paper uh, by a Merck group in, I think, JOC recently, where they used exactly that approach. So that's a great suggestion. It does work. Um, and they use that to actually access some um, HIV antiretroviral uh, drugs that they were they were trying to make by, by um, nucleophilic fluorination. Um, the challenge for the specific project that we're working on is that the, these guys are, are um, process um, doing process agrochemistry. And so for them, the kind of scales they're working on crown ethers are too expensive. It's just, you know, the crown ether is, is still pretty expensive. So that's not the approach that we used only because of the cost of the crown ethers themselves. But I, I think that that approach will work. And in fact, when we do radiochemistry, crown ethers are what we use to solubilize the fluoride. So, so yes, it does work, um, but it just depends on sort of the cost tolerance of the reactions that you want to do. Yeah, thank you. So on the next question we have, did you try Lewis acid to activate it pyridine further to make stable Mesenheimer complex? So sorry, what, can you repeat? So, so the that? question okay. is, so the question is around using Lewis acids to activate it pyridine. Uh, for hmm. your stable Mesenheimer complexes? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the challenge, I guess, would be that, uh, um, you know, the Lewis acid probably wouldn't be compatible with the fluoride um, so salts. So I think that that's the challenge is that you need to, I guess you'd probably have to add the Lewis acid first and bind it to the pyridine and then add the fluoride source, but there still might be an equilibrium where the fluoride would complex with the with the Lewis acid. And, and so we haven't tried that. It's an interesting idea, but I think that, you know, if there's an equilibrium there, you might run into problems with um, competition between the pyridine and the fluoride. Yeah. So uh, moving on to the next question, Professor Sanford, uh, does steric hindrance play a role in the success of the aryl fluorosulfonate based fluorination? Um, that is a great question. Um, let me just look at the substrates. Um, so, I, I mean, my I'm just trying to remember the scope of these reactions. I mean, you can see um, some pretty sterically hindered substrates. I mean, this, this substrate, for example, here is both um, pretty hindered with this orthoisopropyl and also very, you know, electron rich, um, and it works okay. Um, so I would say that it's it's probably, uh, you know, for example, the orthophenyl actually works better than the paraphenyl. So that's another another sort of comparison of sterics. Um, my, again, we did this chemistry a little bit while ago, and I don't remember all of the specific substrates that were examined, but my recollection is that it is much less sterically sensitive than a transition metal catalysis reaction. So there is some steric effect, but it's it's not that problematic, and, and that some of these pretty hindered substrates will go, you know, as you can see, 83% yield for the orthophenyl. Yeah, sure. So uh, 
Mr. Sanford, we have a next question. Is there any way to do fluorination by CH activation on the inactive carbon? Um, well, so I guess um, that there's what, you know, uh, I, I showed um, an example of this is directed CH activation, but this is chemistry that we did um, catalyzed by palladium. Um, so, you know, using a directing group, you do a CH activation here and then a fluorination. So that does work um, well uh, with palladium catalysis. We also have some other examples and other groups have other examples where people use copper catalysis to do aryl fluorination using this sort of directing group approach. And then there's a lot of examples where people do sp3 ch fluorination um, using a radical mechanism with fluorine sources so so there are ways to do it i mean it's 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 significantly harder than um than you know when you when you you know have a have an activated group as opposed to a ch bond um maybe just one other comment about that um another thing that we've done um is uh here you see we have aryl boron starting materials to form these fluorinated products. You can make aryl boron starting materials by CH activation through um, Hartwig and, and Mitch Smith's um, CH borylation reactions, right? So one way to do what you're suggesting um, indirectly is to do a CH borylation and then in one pot, this copper catalyzed fluorination. And we recently had a paper showing that that does work and you can do that electric, uh, sorry, um, uh, radio in a radiochemical sense as well. So there are ways to do it, but it's more complicated than, than some of these other reactions, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Sanford. Uh, moving on to the next question. So uh, how to select which transition metal to use as a catalyst for such kind of reactions? Yeah, I mean, so that's a great question. And, and the way that we typically do that is by, um, thinking about mechanism, which is what I what I told you <clears throat> in the introduction a little bit. So, so um, as I said, uh, typically the most challenging step for these aryl fluorinations is the reductive elimination. So typically what we do, um, I mean, there's lots of approaches you could take. You could just screen a lot of things. Um, you could do some calculations and come up with a prediction. I think what we do is typically either make model complexes or rely on model complexes. And this, you know, this is a good example where Rebus had actually done the work already so we just sort of looked in the literature and found this. Um, but basically find examples where you can do the, a stoichiometric example of that challenging step. So this is copper three aryl reacting with a fluoride source to form the aryl fluoride. Um, and, you know, and then based on that, um, we then try to design our catalytic cycle around the intermediates that have been isolated and studied. Um, so that's our approach is typically to kind of look at the organometallic literature, identify what the challenging step is. In this case, it's the CF reductive elimination, and then use the metals and, and types of ligands that have been used to promote that challenging step of the reaction. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sanford. So uh, again, uh, there is a question from uh, Jennifer Moore. Uh, I work for your former postdoc, Doc Genat. YSU, in your opinion, do you foresee a future for electrophilic aromatic substitution pathways for the fluorine chemistry, a, uh, aromatic fluorine bond formation for substrates that may be more difficult due to their highly electron donating nature or are safe fluorine electrophiles too cost prohibitive? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, definitely, right, if you, ch I mean, again, this is sort of relates back to what I said in the talk, this idea that, yeah, changing the mechanism. Um, you know, is a way to, to get around um, a lot of these challenges. And, and you're exactly right that um, if you want to fluorinate electron rich substrates, right, an electrophilic mechanism is, 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 is the sort of electronically matched way to do that. I guess, um, and, and it turns out you can do that. It, the, um, you need to find the right electrophilic source of fluorine and, and, and certainly with an electrophilic aromatic reaction, you can have selectivity issues and things like that, especially with fluorine electrophiles. Um, the other challenge is that depending on your application, these electrophilic fluorinating reagents tend to be quite costly and they're much, much more sort of corrosive and dangerous than the fluoride sources typically. So, you know, there's challenges associated with that. And, and certainly in the context of the work we would do with Dow, they're not too interested in electrophilic mechanisms because there's a cost and there's a sort of corrosiveness that they just don't want to have to deal with. But I think one of the cool things about fluorination chemistry is there's so many different applications, large scale, like agrochemicals, small scale, like radiochemistry. And so different approaches to tackle different substrates on different scales with different price points 
um, is, is fine because there you can find an application for almost anything you develop. Um, you know, if people want to make a fluorinated molecule, they'll probably use your chemistry. So I think that that's a great point. And certainly that is a really good approach, particularly for very electron rich substrates. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Professor Sanford. So there is a question on using methanol as a solvent in these kind of uh, nucleophilic reactions in fluorine chemistry. So your insights on that? Um, using methanol as a solvent is... Um, you know, in the chemistry that I showed you at the end, we use sort of one equivalent of an alcohol in the reactions, and that already attenuates the nucleophilicity of the fluoride significantly. So that, you know, in this chemistry here, right? So, um, whoops. Um, you know, we, we have one equivalent of alcohol and, and we, we now get a much slower rate because of the hydrogen bonding with the fluoride. Um, if when we go to an alcohol solvent, uh, that becomes much more problematic. So the rates get prohibitively slow for these reactions. Um, people have done SN2 fluorinations in alcohol solvents with these, you know, alkyl ammonium fluoride. So you can get nucleophilic fluoride under those conditions, but typically an SNAR reaction requires uh, um, pretty high nucleophilicity. And I would say that, that um, at least in our experience, what we've tried so far, when we go to an alcohol solvent, that tends to be kind of a, a, a step too, too far. So, you know, it's, a, it's an open question. It'd be interesting problem to solve, but we have not, you know, been able to do it so far. It doesn't typically doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the next question, uh, how about the kinetic ba barrier of the intermediates whilst going from the Mesenheimer to the concerted one? Is there any comparative kinetic study with that, Professor Sanford? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and and actually um, some of the papers that I cited here, you can find some data on this. So um, uh, we actually have some calculations in collaboration with Dow that show. Um, so the comparison, I think it was I forget which maybe for this substrate here, um, where um, they, it's a comparison of the barrier for if you just take the aryl chloride, which could basically only undergo the kind of traditional Meissenheimer intermediate. Um, and then the aryl fluorosulfonate. Um, and I don't remember, I mean, the barrier is lower by, I don't know, six or seven kcals per mole. So there's a, there's quite a large difference and maybe even more um, for those two, but that, that's in this Jack's paper here. And then let me just go forward and show you um, this JOC paper. We did a bunch of other sort of rate studies looking at different substituted aromatics and different um, you know, fluorosulfonates and different leaving groups to kind of get a sense um, experimentally of the difference in rates of these kind of substrates. So I would refer you to those papers for the exact data, uh, but this in particular, this paper um, does a detailed computation on the, on the different barriers. And there is quite a large difference between the chloride substrate, which goes through a traditional sort of um, SNAR pathway, and then the and then the aryl fluorosulfonate, where where um, you get this intramolecular delivery of the um, of the fluoride. So, Professor Sanford, we have a lot of questions coming in. So, uh, just I wanted to confirm you are comfortable taking two or three more questions. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, we have a question: What is the reaction outcome when we when when we use tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride instead of tetramethyl ammonium fluoride in the reactions? Um, so we can't use anhydrous tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride directly. Like we can't we can't make that and add it to the reactions. We can generate it in situ. Um, and I, I don't have the paper in here, but we, we have various ways of generating it in situ. Um, and, and actually that works just as well. So if you basically generate anhydrous tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride in situ and then use it for these reactions. So I guess maybe um, specifically this reaction here, uh, you get essentially exactly the same results as you get when you, when you add anhydrous tetramethyl ammonium fluoride. So they are functionally equivalent in the reaction. It's just that this reagent, um, you can isolate and put in a bottle, whereas the tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride in hydrous, you need to generate it in situ and that, that's more complicated. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Professor Sanford. So one question about uh, the yield of the reaction. So mm -hmm. other than using pyridine, if we could convert this pyridine into pyridine and oxide, would it affect yeah. the yield of the reaction? Um, I am sure it would. We haven't tried that experiment. That's a good question. But um, I think the N oxide would make the pyridine um, 
you know, more electrophilic, I, I think. Um, so I, 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 I'm confident that it would affect the, well, may, maybe it wouldn't affect the yield because the yield is very good already. So, but certainly the rates of the reaction would be affected by that. That's a, it's a good question. Um, we haven't done that, but I, I think almost certainly you would get a, a significant effect, yeah, in, on the rate. Yeah. Uh, then I think I'll take the last two questions. So have you observed any corrosion or pitting on the walls of the reaction vessel? If yes, this could be a major obstacle for running on the large scale and might require the use of resistant reactor material like uh, tantalum. So this is a kind of suggestion, I think. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a, a really good point. We do sometimes see etching of our, we typically do these just in glass vials, um, just for convenience. Um, and I, I think that's, um, it's a, it's a great point. It definitely beyond what we worry about, you know, we're sort of developing the chemistry and then Dow or Corteva now they scale it up and deal with the kind of process considerations, but absolutely anytime you're generating fluoride sources, especially HF, you know, you can get this sort of corrosion of your reaction vessel. They are fluorinating things all the time. So they are used to this and I think have the appropriate um, sort of uh, um, reactors to do this chemistry, but it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take the last question, Professor Sanford. Uh, so is it possible to develop any photocatalytic method to prepare aryl fluoride uh, from aryl chloride by generating aryl radical from aryl chloride with the help of a photocatalyst? Um, there was a paper, I think in science, by the Neshevitz group recently at University of North Carolina where they developed a photocatalytic approach to this. I think they used fluoride, not fluorine radicals, and they generated like a radical cation um, photochemically um, of the aromatic and then attacked that with fluoride. I think that that was their approach. Um, so you could look at that. I, I, I Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of photochemical reactions now where people will take an arine, they'll oxidize it to a radical cation, and then they'll trap it with fluoride. And so I think that that is a, is a viable approach um, if you can choose the right set of reagents that don't react with one another. I, I think that's a, it's a certainly a good idea. Yeah. Conceptually. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so I think we have covered most of the questions Professor Sanford and thank you so much for covering all these questions and answering them one by one. So of course there are some un unanswered questions and I think uh, they may be contacting you via email and hope that's okay for you. Uh, so some of the questions, for the unanswered uh, audience, they might be interested in like referring to your articles, uh, which we have at some point of time also mentioned into the chat box. So that would be good for them. And so finally, we come to the end and thank you so much, Professor Sanford for taking your time. Uh, of course, especially early morning times. And it's, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on, on AC Science Talk platform. And what I can say more. So for the audience, uh, Thank you so much for your this uh, amazing and wonderful participation. We had around more than 190 participants in that particular session, and still we could see around 150 in this uh, question and answer session. So we'll be sending out the, the cert certificates for them via email. And once again, thank you so much for your wonderful participation, and we'll meet in the next Asia Science Talk session. Thank you so much, Professor Sanford, for joining with us in this session. Thank you. Thanks a Bye. lot. Have a good evening. Thank you.